Let's pray and we'll get started. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. This Thursday in our second week of Advent. Peace in our hearts and in our minds, in our thoughts and in our hope. We pray that you would accompany us and may we accompany you through this Advent journey. This morning, it feels like a little bit of a disconnect to talk about anger. And yet, if we are honest, there is a lot about this season that can stir anger in us. So we ask that your Holy Spirit would be present with us in this time, that we might connect with your scripture, that your Holy Spirit might open our hearts and minds that we might turn our attention toward you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All righty then. So let me go ahead and launch this PowerPoint so that everybody can see it online and in the room. Ta-da! So I chose red not for Christmas, but because... <laughs> Red is kind of the color of anger, right? Isn't it interesting that anger has its own color? So let me get the girls in the room. Let me see if someone else jumped in here when I wasn't looking. Yes, Mary Beth Ziblich has joined us. Welcome, Mary Beth. Glad to have you. All right. Okay, so we begin this morning with Psalm 11, to the leader of David. So it's not to the leader of David, it's to the leader period of David. The psalm is attributed to David. I remind us of our study in the BMC when we studied Solomon. Or not, no, that's not what I wanted to say. When we studied First and Second Samuel, which is the life of David, and um, we continued to sort of reflect on David and all that he did well and all that he did poorly, and the, um, the sort of motto that has been attributed to David as a man after God's own heart. And here is a psalm of anger and it's attributed to David, and the Holy Spirit has seen fit to keep it in the canon. Now, if you had a chance to read David Taylor's text, then you know that C.S. Lewis, in his Reflections on the Psalms, which is another book that we read for the summer class that we took, um, he basically goes, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm out on this. Let's just ignore it. And, and it's not quite that extreme, but he basically doesn't have a theological explanation for why anger, um, the, they refer to it as the imprecatory psalms, it's accusing, it's even a cursing kind of psalm, why this is included in the Psalter. <clears throat> I think it's so much more simple than making it a big theological thing. We get angry. So does God. So did Jesus. And at the end of the day, what we're talking about is not whether or not to get angry, but when you are angry, notice that you will be angry. So when you are angry, what are you going to do with your anger? Psalm 11, in the Lord, I take refuge. How can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains for look? The wicked bend the bow. They've fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, 
his gaze examines humankind. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and his soul hates the lover of violence. On the wicked, the Lord will rain coals of fire and sulfur. A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. <laughs> the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Don't you love it? I love, I love the, um, the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. His soul hates the lover of violence. On the wicked, he will rain coals of fire and sulfur. A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. A little bit of a disconnect there, right? Well, if we take a look at the structure of a psalm of anger, we find that it's very similar to the structure of a psalm of sadness. Because sadness always lies at the core of our experiences of anger, the basic shape of cursed psalms follows the basic shape of psalms of lament. Because at the end of the day, a psalm of anger is a psalm of lament. So there is a complaint, a petition, and a response. So let's go back to the beginning of Psalm 11 and see if we can identify the complaint, the petition, and the response. This one is a little bit different in that um, the complaint is one of those I wasn't doing anything wrong. It's when, it's when a child comes to a parent and says, I wasn't doing anything wrong. Which of course, you know, stirs in the parent. So what, did what happened? <laughs> <laughs> what did you do or what happened or who did it? <laughs> Whatever it is that was wrong that you have come to tell me about. So we have David kind of taking that posture of, Hey, I wouldn't do anything wrong. In the Lord, I take refuge. But how can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? So here's the complaint. We went really quickly to complaint. <laughs> how can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? For look, the wicked bend the bow. They fitted their arrow to the string. You know, I think that one of the things that delving into poetry has helped me do, and I hope that it's helped you do as well, is to begin to see the poetry that is in the Psalms, not in its structure, not in its rhyme, but in the way that poems grab images for us so that we, so that the image can conjure up for us a feeling or an experience. So to say, that the wicked bend the bow and they fitted their arrow to the string. All right, so if you have a, a bow from a bow and arrow, when the bow is, is relaxed, it is, um, you know, it has sort of a curve to it like this, right? Just a gentle curve. But to bend the bow is to pull the string back, right? And when you do that and you've pulled the string, you pull down on the two ends of the bow and it's taut and tight. So what's happening here is not, oh, but they have bows and they might shoot me if I flee. It's, I can't even flee from the wicked. They have already fitted their arrow into the string of the bow. They've already bent the bow. And then the natural conclusion is they've already aimed at me. Right, so so we have this image of the the um, the speaker feels under fire. Right? It's imminent. This this, and so they're coming to the Lord, saying, "I take refuge in you, but <laughs> but but there's an actual you know threat against my life." So when we find ourselves reading the Psalms. I think one of the things that we have to do is, is kind of put ourselves in a place of holy imagination. You've heard that term before, yes? Um, 
I'm working on my sermon for the 26th. I'm preaching the day after Christmas. So you have somewhere to be, right? You need to come on down to church on December 26th. <laughs> hang out with me and Roxy at 1115. I asked her to do a children's sermon since there's only one service at 1115. Um, and, and I'm preaching on Simeon and Anna. And one of the things that I'm trying to sort of figure out how I might be able to do in a sermon is to welcome people into that Jesuit exercise of, of engaging our imagination in the text by putting ourselves into the story, right? So with Simeon and Anna, I'm going to, in my sermon, invite people to go to the temple themselves, go be in the, in the temple in Jerusalem and watch this scene unfold. And then, you know, we'll talk about it. So we want to learn how to do that ourselves with regard to the Psalms. And sometimes we, we realize that we have this inner dialogue that's kind of like I can't do math, which is I don't understand poetry, which can make the Psalms feel inaccessible for us until we let the Psalms draw us into the story through our imagination. So I don't know if you can remember the last time that you engaged in archery. I can because we took a confirmation class to um, the Calvin Center, I want to say maybe four years ago, five years ago, and we did archery as one of the ways of talking about sin and, you know, because sin literally means to miss the mark. So we did archery and, and, you know, talked about how you can be as diligent as you possibly can, you know, pulling back that bow and pointing your arrow. But when you let go, sometimes the arrow, you know, goes somewhere it's not supposed to. I also remember that I let go and that string just took me from here to here and I just had the nastiest looking like burn bruise kind of thing going on on my arm but but letting letting the poetry take us into the imaginative so that we can think what would it feel like to be in a situation where we feel like someone is pointing a, a, an arrow at us now, sometimes it's a literal arrow, like we really feel like our lives are in danger, but mostly those are arrows of words. They are arrows of emotion. They're arrows of um, discontent, of, of even dislike. And those can feel as sharp and as threatening as a real bow and arrow. So if we let ourselves think about what it would be like to have someone right at us with an arrow and thinking, I don't want that <laughs> to hit me, please. Then we realize that, oh, these images are actually access points for us to think about our own emotions, our own things that we're feeling. So, it's this sense of, I actually think it's really marvelous and beautiful. I want to take refuge in the Lord. Don't you? I want to believe that I both have and am able to cultivate a life with the Lord in such a way that I can Look, there's nowhere for me to hide, right? I can hide in the shadow of his wing. I can be hidden in God with Christ, the way Colossians says that we are. But with the psalmist, the truth is that no matter how hard I run towards the Lord, no matter how hard I try, I still weekly, daily have experiences where I feel like there are arrows pointing at me. Taylor talks about those arrows sometimes coming from an unknown threat, like when he discusses having his infant in the back seat of his car, driving around the streets of Durham and feeling like every other car is, is you know, going to, to take the life of him and, and his, his daughter. So some of those are just those kind of deep-seated fears. Do you find that there are some areas of your life that where as you get older, you get more fearful? Are you more afraid? You know, I, I, um, I've been trying to walk 
every day and some days and I used to walk early in the morning and I just don't want to anymore. I've found that I really enjoy early morning as a time for writing. And so it, I finally have just sort of said, okay, then I'm going to walk in the afternoons. I, I've used as an excuse not to walk that, you know, my boys are home and I want to be with them. Well, you know, Leif is playing Minecraft with earbuds in listening to a video at the same time that he's building his kingdom in Minecraft. And Finn is, you know, currently reading Jane Eyre, <laughs> came in yesterday and said, I have finally realized why people say this is a good book, but it took me 157 pages to get to that point. You know? and, and so, you know, no more excuses. I, I'm going for walks in the, in the afternoon and evening, except that it gets dark and it's wet and there are leaves all over the sidewalk. And have you noticed that the sidewalks often do this? And y'all, I have fallen a number of times because, you know, I'm walking fast, the dog is pulling me. I can't see very well. And, and, uh, and I get afraid of falling and I use that fear as an excuse not to walk, right? So I think that um, we, we have to, I have no idea why I just told you that story about walking and being afraid of falling. Oh, as you get older, are you fear? Do you find that you're more fearful, right? And so, some of the things that that we are fearful about are like genuine threats, and other things are are um, not so much. They're more conceived in our mind, or sort of like the imagination says, "Oh, well, what if this happens?" Kind of thing. Well, one of our responses, one of the most powerful responses to fear, is anger. Usually, there is something behind the anger that we are feeling and even expressing. And it's often fear or grief. Those are the two primary things that stir anger in us. Now, anger is a separate emotion from sadness, from, from fear. But, but it ought to prompt us to say, huh, I'm angry. I wonder what's going on here. Why am I angry? You know, yesterday, I found myself angry with the person who was in front of me because it was clear that he was on the phone and was not driving in a reasonable fashion. And I watched him keep looking down like this. You know, I could see through his car and it really bugged me. So I, so I said, well, I invited everyone to pay attention to, the, to whether or not they got angry this week and what made them angry. And so I thought, I'm angry because I'm a rule follower and you're not supposed to be on your phone when you're driving your car. So, you know, put it in a thingy and, or put it in your pocket and just drive your dumb car. And then I thought, really, Megan, is that it? Cause you're, you know, totally hypocritical. If you're trying to say that you're never on your phone while you're driving your car, <laughs> you're just on your phone and it's right here instead of looking down. Right. And then what I realized is I was anxious because I was trying to get home in time to get Leif from school. And Leif gets out early on Wednesdays. So I feel a little bit more anxious to get there because I had set an alarm to leave at a certain time, but a couple of us were chatting and it was a fun little chat. I wasn't sure that I really wanted to leave right that second. And I knew that I had plenty of time to get home. <laughs> But then as I'm like halfway down Ponce, I remember, oh, but wait, Ponce is under construction and it's going to narrow down to one lane. Get the hell out of my way. I'm driving you know, again. You know? And all of a sudden I'm mad. It's like, okay, so I'm anxious about getting to my kid on time. And I try to mitigate that by leaving early. But I didn't leave as early as I normally do. And so underneath the anger or... You could even say stoking the fire of my anger was this anxiety and concern and frustration that had to do with trying to get to a certain place on time. Well, that's kind of superficial. We know that David was actually hunted down by Saul on a number of occasions. We also know that David as king of Israel was sort of constantly under fire right? Because everybody around Israel wanted that space, wanted that land. And, um, and so he lived in this sort of constant state of fear, anxiety, grief, and anger, because he was constantly embattled. Have you ever had a season in your life where you were constantly embattled? 
And so you find yourself in this position where you're saying, in the Lord, I take refuge. But it's really hard to take refuge in the Lord, isn't it? Because we have in our mind that taking refuge in the Lord is like this going away, this, this going off to another place. Maybe taking refuge in the Lord in your mind is having a quiet time in the morning. Or maybe taking refuge in the Lord in your mind is going on a hike, sort of reaching that vista where you have this wonderful overlook and you can take this deep breath and go, oh, I just feel so good to be hidden here in the Lord, to take refuge in the Lord. But the psalmist actually shows us that in the same act of taking refuge in the Lord, we also have arrows being shot at us, which is why we seek refuge in the Lord in the first place. This is a really hard place to live. People are critical. They're mean. They have their own stuff that often motivates them to say things that aren't very well examined in their own lives, and they point them toward you, or they're complete strangers, and they've done something idiotic, and then they honk at you, and you're the one who was doing the right thing. Lisa shared last night, not this Lisa, but Lisa Wells shared last night that she was just this close to being T-boned on Monday, taking Vivian to work because some idiot ran a red light and it was her turn to go. And then he honks at her. So, so he has stirred in her that like fright of, I almost got hit. And then he had the to honk at her and she was mad. So here we are trying to navigate these feelings of anger. And David is saying, I'm coming to the Lord. I'm seeking refuge in the Lord. So how can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? I can't possibly flee from this situation that I'm finding myself in because the bow is already bent. The arrow is already cocked. It's already pointed at me. And not only that, but it's going to hit me right in the heart. And isn't that true? How often the arrows of people hit us right in the heart. Because honestly, it would be awful to get shot in the arm with an arrow. And it would be awful to be shot in the leg or the butt. But the heart is where your life is in danger. And the kinds of arrows that people can shoot at us, hit us in the heart. So we agree with everything that David is saying. Yes, we've had these experiences. Yes, we're trying to seek refuge in God, but my goodness, where are we supposed to go? I can't fly away from here. I have to live the life that I've been called to live. My life can't always be long hikes by myself in the woods to a beautiful vista. I have to navigate this world that I'm living in. And then there is this classic question that we found in the Psalms of Lament. We, we said that the Psalms of Lament were sadness. The Psalms of Lament are both sadness and anger. And it's this question of God, like, you know, <laughs> if the righteous fall, the foundation is destroyed. Sometimes we have to do that in the Psalms. We have to actually read the line backward. The line actually is, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Read the line backwards. If the righteous fall, the foundations are destroyed. Like they're wedded to each other, the foundations and the righteous, because God is righteousness, right? The foundation of the people of Israel is righteousness. It's life in God. It's life in obedience to the Torah. It's, it's life in relationship with God. So if there's nobody to be in relationship with God, then what you got left? God. <laughs> right? Now, I'm wondering if we're getting to that point where we're like, mm, yeah, I can't quite do it. I can't quite bring my anger to God. And I wonder, I wonder where you are on that. So let me just go So there are four themes that we find in the Psalms of anger. <clears throat> the first is 
whatever else the curse psalms are about, it's another word for the anger psalms, the curse psalms, they are about God. The Psalter opens with language describing God who judges the wicked, and it closes with language describing the God who judges the wicked. You know, I don't know about you, but when we started out and we looked at Psalm 1, I sort of expected that Psalm 1 would be like Psalm 100. It would be this wonderful praise psalm to the Lord, and that we would all just sort of uh, just read it in adoration. And Psalm 1 begins, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. They take refuge in the law of the Lord. So then if we flip all the way to the very last Psalm, I actually don't think it's the very last Psalm. Yeah, that's entirely a psalm of praise, but I think it's, I think the last like 10 psalms are all psalms of praise, but I think that he was saying that it's Psalm 137. Yeah, this sort of bookend to um, Psalm 1 is Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against a rock. <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, I think 137 is on our list for January for the second half of the anger psalms. And did you hear the, did you hear the sorrow that's in the first half of that psalm and then the anger towards the other half? You know, that anger gets cultivated sometimes when we come up against what feels like injustice. Now, the word injustice is a big word. It's a big word that has big implications in our lives. And in the same way that we have a tendency to compare our suffering with one another, we also have a tendency to compare our injustice towards one another. And we tend to compare our suffering like this. Well, I'm not suffering as badly as this other person, so I don't really deserve your presence, your care. You know, people have had it a lot worse than me. And, and we have this sort of sense like we're not worthy of people's attention, of a casserole, of their presence, of being on the prayer list, of, of people knowing that we're having a hard time. And similarly, we do that with injustice. We know that there have been horrible injustices to people, done to people in our culture. And so when we experience our own little injustice, we have a tendency to go, well, it's nothing compared to the injustice of others. So I guess I'll just not say anything about it. I'll just ignore it. But you know, the opposite opportunity there is to go, wow, I'm really feeling wronged. And this really feels like an injustice. So if I were to sit with this and the anger that it has stirred in me, how might that better equip me to sit with someone else in their experience of injustice? How might I be able to listen with empathy to someone else's 
different experience of injustice because I've taken the time to recognize what stirs in me when I'm a victim of injustice. It stirs anger. It stirs a feeling of being unknown and often of being unseen. And it doesn't take a lot. Have you ever been aware that someone is talking about you behind your back? And, and have you ever felt in that situation, why didn't that person come and talk to me directly? Because if they had, then I could have shared my side of things, or I could have asked them to slow their roll with whatever it is they're talking about, or I could have corrected them and let them know that they're off. Instead, what happens is we kind of find out in the same gossipy way that someone's been talking about us, that someone's been talking about us, right? And then we're in this place of feeling like this is really unjust. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to have people talking about me behind my back. I deserve to have them come to me directly. When it happens in the body of Christ, and God forbid, you know that it does, there's this moment of, hold on, I thought we agreed to different playground rules than this. <laughs> Ultimately, the Psalms of anger are about God because God is the God of justice. And when an injustice occurs in our own lives, in our families, in our community, the author of justice is the best place for us to take our injustice. Even when we're asking that author why he let it happen this way, which is what our psalmist is doing in Psalm 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. You know, David sort of acknowledging that God is up here in his holy temple and his throne being in heaven and his eyes being able to see everything from that vantage point is kind of saying, and I'm down here by myself. Where are you? Because I haven't seen you lately. He gets into this language of the Lord tests the righteous and the wicked and his soul hates the lover of violence. I just need to sort of put this asterisk. Hold on just a second. Let me address this. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. Um, I take issue with that language a little bit, especially when people then take that language and <clears throat> suggest that the thing that you're encountering right now is just God testing you. Yeah, I, there's a lot of evidence, especially in the New Testament, to suggest that no, that's actually not how God functions, nor was it how God functioned in the Old Testament. It's an interpretation of our lived experience. How else is it that the rain falls on the just and the unjust, except that God is testing us? But is that really what God is doing? Yes, ma'am. Uh, NLT says he examined. Okay. I'm good with examine. Anybody else got another word for test? Nope. Anybody online got a different word for test? Okay. I think another way of reading this is that there isn't a different set of circumstances for the righteous and the wicked. We are all human. We all live in this broken world. We all navigate the same pathways. The question, a lot of it has to do with is what's your response? What's your response to what you're experiencing? And arguably what the psalmist is saying is go to God. The righteous in their anger go to God. The unrighteous in their anger just kind of 
bleed all over everybody or cause everybody else to bleed, I think you could say, right? Go to God in your anger. That's the way of the righteous. The way of the righteous is always to take refuge in the Lord. Oh, and by the way, you know, if you do that, according to the psalmist, the wicked will get rain, coals of fire and sulfur rained on them, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. They're going to get what they deserve. Okay, now, that, taken to its extreme, gets us to a theology that we don't agree with. Because taken to its extreme is to say that if you are righteous, then good things will happen to you. If you are unrighteous, then bad things will happen to you. And you will get what you deserve. Except that we all deserve. We all deserve coals of fire and sulfur raining down on us and a scorching wind blowing against us because Paul tells us in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, not one except for Jesus. So what are we supposed to do with this part of the psalm? Because on the one hand, we got that, that irony at least of God has a soul that hates violence and he's going to rain down fire and sulfur and burning coals and a scorching wind on the, on the wicked. <laughs> that doesn't sound violent at all, does it? <laughs> For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Well, if the psalmist was using the imagery of a bow and arrow to draw us into the thing that he was feeling, he is under attack, under fire. And that arrow is already pointing at its heart, at his heart. If poetry invites us into a way of seeing in a particular kind of form or fashion, then what might the psalmist be saying here? Don't stand there looking at me like I've got the answer to this question. What might the psalmist be saying here? Well, have you ever seen coals of fire? and sulfur and a scorching wind come down? Well, please don't say yes. <laughs> that, that was a rhetorical question okay, that you're yes. supposed to say no to. What? Okay, yes, all right, so fine. In a volcano, yes, yes, yes. 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 And if you've been in, you know, what's it called out in the West? Is it Death Valley? Yeah, there's a scorching wind there, so yes. But have you ever seen someone like trip an old lady walking on the sidewalk and then have fire rain down on them? You know, there's not like there's not an experience of you did wicked, swoop you, and then the next thing you know, you're you know, like on fire from God. We don't have any evidence that during David's lifetime there was an, a, a volcanic explosion that that occurred anywhere near. So we'll get to it in just a second, maybe, who knows. Um, but the, <laughs> we might get to it. One of the four points of anger's, uh, anger psalms, well, let me just find it, hang on, um, is that some of this language is hyperbole. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> Yeah, so it's in it's in the third theme in the Psalm of Anger. So the cursing language of the Psalms 
is akin to profane language. The psalmist's experience of violence inevitably provokes hyperbolic language as a way to express the shocking violation of the good order of God's world. So for example, Psalm 35, one, Peterson renders it, harass these hecklers, God, punch these bullies in the nose. Um, the new revised standard version of Psalm 35, one is contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me, fight against those who fight against me. And for those of us who had a big brother, you know, that it's sort of that feeling like hoping your big brother's going to show up and, and deal with these bullies, right? That, that we're looking for God to kind of show up and, and, um, and fight our battle with and for us. Yeah, Mary Louise. You know, we've been talking about this part, it makes me remember or think about those times driving somebody screaming, being terribly, terribly dangerous maneuvers, and you're included in it, and then you say, go see the continuum of that. And then, um, I think that some must take some uh, relief of the angel by saying they kind of strong. Language. Yes, amen, sister. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. At the end of the day, at the end of this day, the conclusion that we really want to come to is that there is one good place for our anger, and that is God. And we can take it in that sort of God's big boy, he can handle it kind of perspective. We can also take it in a when we first go to the Lord with our anger, we can sit with it in front of the Lord for the sake of discernment. Some anger ought to be expressed. Can you think of a time when anger was expressed and it ought to have been? Okay, you got one for me? This is so unbelievable. Very good. Uh, man speaking to a huge bunch of teachers at the beginning of the school year and motivating to be a motivational speaker. And he was amazing. He's so good. And then he kind of got off on it. I'm not sure. I can't even remember how he got off on this. And his last behavior was to grab his crotch in front of all these women and I'm, I'm like, yeah, I didn't understand what was going on. I've lost whatever I think his point was. I've lost the motivation. The whole thing. It was just uh, kind of defiance of everybody. I felt deeply whatever he was doing. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> he defiled it. Yeah. Mary Louise told the story of being at a teacher training conference and uh, the speaker uh, was doing really well, giving this really motivational, thoughtful talk. And um, but then he sort of veered into unknown territory and at the end of his talk, grabbed his crotch in front of this whole you know, auditorium of teachers, most of whom were women and and uh, defiled, as Mary Louise said, the good part of his talk. And, and, and stirred in her anger and, and to speak to him to say that was absolutely inappropriate. It is threatening. It is trauma stirring in anyone who's a victim of sexual violence. And you should not do that. Those are reasonable words spoken to someone in anger when their behavior is unreasonable. Any other narratives of when anger ought to be spoken, ought to be expressed. Well, one of the things, if we think about anger within the context of the spiritual disciplines, and we allow the truth that anger is not bad, and I wanna talk about that in just a second, 
but but we we recognize anger as it, it, we get angry, we are joyful, we are sad, we are happy, we are, right? Human, yeah? And anger is actually not a base human emotion. It is not a result of the fall. It is who we were created to be. We have dynamic capacity for feeling, and God created us as feeling beings, and anger is one of them. But the spiritual discipline of going first to the Lord in our anger is what allows us to be righteously angry as opposed to unrighteously angry. So what do I mean by that? If I express anger about something in front of Eric, he, he knows the whole of who I am. So he knows that he knows what I'm like when I'm happy. He knows what I'm like when I'm sad. And he knows what I'm like when I'm joyful. He knows what I'm like when I'm angry. He also knows that I'm an Enneagram four and we've done enough Enneagram work and conversation in our family to know that Enneagram fours have really big emotions, but they kind of do this. They get really big like this. And then they come back into, you know, sort of a, <laughs> it reminds me of, uh, of, um, uh, dirty dancing when Patrick Swayze says this is my dance frame this is your dance frame you know my emotions go way outside my dance frame sometimes but then they come back and I settle back into my dance frame if you know me well if we've had an opportunity to cultivate a relationship then you know that I might swell really large and it might kind of scare you but it comes back down you know into something that's more reasonable but I think if we tell the truth about ourselves, we find that when our emotions go outside our dance frame and someone doesn't know us well, they can define us by that swell of emotion rather than that emotion that has been examined and is in control. So by going to the Lord first with our anger, and saying, I'm so angry that they were talking about me, that they were gossiping about me before the Lord, and then sit with that truth of our anger and frustration, which is what the Psalms are inviting us to do, and sit with David and be like, I feel like they have an arrow that is pulled back, already cocked on the string, pointed right at me. And, and I feel like they're going to let go of it and it's going to destroy me. When we take that to the Lord and sit with it, then we can trust the Holy Spirit to sort of pull the tendrils of it back into our dance frame so that when we go to the other with our anger and frustration, it's examined it's control, it's God known, and we've invited the Holy Spirit to accompany us in whatever confrontation we feel like needs to happen because of our anger. How many of us have used or heard the term half-cocked? You know, don't go off half-cocked. You know, a gun that is half-cocked can sometimes go off and shoot a bullet. We don't want to shoot bullets in our anger. But being angry is not wrong. So <laughs> I rearranged my slides last night and I am all over the place. Um, so if we had the time and we don't, um, I would invite you. So write the question down. Maybe you'll take this to the Lord yourself. When is the last time you were angry? And what did you notice about your anger? And what messages did you tell yourself? When is the last time you were angry? What did you notice about your anger? And what were the messages that you told yourself? Now, I suspect that the messages that you told yourself have a lot to do with the culture of anger that you were raised in. So what are some of the cultural rules that you heard as a child or a teenager or even a young adult um, with regard to anger? Don't. 
Don't put a lid on it. Can I, can I rightly assume that you were not given permission to be angry? Do you think it has anything to do with where you were raised or what your gender is? Yes. <laughs> some yes, some no. Turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek, yes. What else? Thank you, Laura. Don't take it personally. Don't take it personally, which is another way of saying you, you I'm not validating your anger. So I guess all of you were teased when you were kids. Yeah. Is that right? Judy's asking if we were all teased when we were kids. But the narrative then was sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt, hurt me. Right. So the words to me are get over it. Yes. It's okay. It's not a big deal. Yes. And those things still hurt. Oh, yes. I, I preached on that two weeks ago. Yeah. Judy was remembering that as a child, you know, the, the guiding, um, the guiding counsel was sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may not, never hurt me. Um, and and uh, <laughs> I remember the day I was an adult that I went, yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it really is. There's no other word for it. That's ridiculous. Who thought that that was a good thing to say to children? <laughs> <laughs> she's laughing because i have um this it's your son you know that he is calling is the song that comes up when my good looking boy calls me i love the way he calls me during bible study almost every day yeah. thanks to <laughs> it. yeah um we had a pretty robust conversation last night in bible study about um, the number of us who I think in part being raised in the South, I think in part being raised in the church, and I think in part being women, we were not given a lot of permission to be angry. And if you are a woman of color, you're insulted for being angry. Your anger is diminished into being an angry black woman and being pushed aside and not validated for your anger. A lot of us who were raised in the church were told that we weren't allowed to be angry, that anger is bad, that it's unrighteous, that, that it's not permissible. And so we were not given tools for dealing with our anger. Yeah. It's not, it's not appropriate to be angry. Yes. Yes. Right. So Glenn is saying that she recognizes that she's a spiritual director. So in spiritual direction, she often hears that theme of people struggling with feeling anger because they're judging themselves for feeling angry because they, they were raised in a culture that says you're not allowed to be angry or you should not be angry or angry is not what good Christian girls do. Jillian said that she learned to just smack the heck out of a tennis ball against the, the side of her house for her anger. <clears throat> and that's true about anger, isn't it? Anger is a really physical emotion. It, it, it has, like, we feel it from our toes to our fingers and all the way, like, and in fact, one of the ways that we picture anger is steam coming out of our ears, Right. <laughs> That's poetic. You could hear it in the song. God, I'm so angry. Steam is coming out of my ears. You know, is steam literally coming out of your ears? No, but that's what anger can do to us. It like causes an interior boil. And we wish that steam would just come out of our ears. Usually it comes out of our mouth in the form of something cruel that we say. And unfortunately, in a lot of situations, it comes out of people's hands and feet in abuse, physical abuse that they carry out against one another. I think we have ways of diverting our anger. Oh, say more about that, Mary Beth. And um, in ways that might seem acceptable. Um, I'll just, I'll give you an answer. Yesterday, I, I, 
I, I had a scan and I was real upbeat about it and I felt good. I thought, I know they're not going to find anything and I don't even know the results. But then I, I got some bad results from a lab and I found myself just going out and doing immediately. I went out and I had to eat just stuff that wasn't good for me. Okay. And it's like, I got to eat. And it was, and I, I asked myself, okay, so why are you doing all this? Not that anything's wrong with eating. Right. But eating like a whole thing of um, jingle jangle from Trader Joe's <laughs> probably is not the best thing. You know, it was good, but, I, but some of that I know was anger, but it, you know, I just had to sit with it and recognize it and just say, I guess I've been there enough to say, okay, why are you doing what you're doing? What's really going on here? And then yeah. that's just one form it takes. Okay. That could be more innocuous, but only we know if it is or isn't. It's so real and honest to, to share that. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry about the bad test results. It's not all um, over, so, but thank you. Good. good. Um, it, it, that is so true. We engage in behavior that is anger diverted, to use Mary Beth's term. And what is required of us is the willingness to examine our interior. But that's something that takes some time and some practice and to notice that we're doing it. I don't do this very much anymore, but I specifically remember riding to school in the back of my brother's VW bug scripting in my head what I was going to say to that person. You know that person who did that thing that was mean? I remember writing out the dialogue in my mind. He's going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and then he's going to say this, and then I'm going to take him by the shirt and be like, you know, and, and I had it all, all scripted out. You know, of course, I got to school, and they either didn't say the thing to trigger the dialogue, or I totally chickened out. But I can assure you that I didn't have a reputation in middle school of grabbing people by their, their shirt and, and, you know, cursing them out. Oh, but I had this interior dialogue about what I would say. And I suppose in some ways I do still rehearse conversations that I think maybe should be had, but not necessarily sure that it would be helpful beyond just me getting to say what I think needs to be said. Is it necessarily going to be well received by the other person? Or am I just going to end up being, you know, even more poorly, poorly seen and received? But I think that it's important for us to recognize that seeing our anger, expressing our anger, and then asking for guidance about our anger are all parts of a spiritual discipline of being angry. That I think is a whole lot healthier than eating an entire box of Jingle Jangle, to use Mary Beth's um, analogy, or example, rather. Um, hey, yeah. I, years ago when my kids were junior high, I watched myself, someone yelled at me and was really angry with me and I would turn around and be angry with my kids. Instead of acknowledging my anger, I would just lash out at them really hard. Yes, yes. And we also have to recognize that anger is a shield emotion. Anger, more often than not, is guarding a, a, another level of emotion that we do not want you to have access to. So anger is a shield for us so that you can't get at my sadness, my grief, my fatigue, you know, as a mom of young kids, my, um, my uh, self-critique my sense of feeling not enough, 
I don't want you to have access to all of that. So anger is a self um, defense mechanism that we have to, to guard those deeper emotions. But it means that we have to do good work around anger in order to not sin in our anger, in order for anger to be productive. And then ultimately, if it's in direction with a spiritual director like Lennis, or it's in um, your, your own prayer life, or in a conversation with a friend or a spouse or a pastor or your therapist, we need to examine that shield that went up and ask the question, what was it guarding? What was it guarding? When we take our anger to the Lord, we take that first step of examination of that anger. And the first step of examining the anger is to be honest about it. You know, another way of of just saying what David is saying in Psalm 11 is, I'm so mad. Except that, does that draw you as deeply into his anger and his fear as I feel like bows and arrows are being pointed at me and you, God, where are you? I'm told to take refuge in you. I'm told to fly like a bird toward you, but there is already an arrow that is pointing directly at me. And where are you? I'm righteous. I'm doing everything that I think I'm supposed to do, but they've got the arrow pointed right at the heart of the, of the upright. And you're in heaven on your throne. Could it be, let us go back to Psalm 11. Could it be that this is absolute hyperbole? On the wicked, he will rain coals of fire and sulfur. A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. How does it sound to you if I say it like this? Oh, oh, on the wicked, he'll rain coals of fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. <laughs> I haven't seen that, have you? If it's hyperbole, if it's sarcasm, if it's, this is what I really want to say, this is what I really want to see happen. What you don't get from the psalmist is what you do get from the person speaking. If David were here, and if we took out some of the poetic form and put it into prose, can you see him? Oh, I was going to go out from in front of the camera. So can you see him? He's going, man, I was so angry that I just wanted God to rain down coals of fire on them. I mean, I literally could just see it. There was their army. It was amassed on the brow of that mountain. They were up there looking down on us. Their arrows were already cocked and pointed towards us. And, and I, I, uh, I just wanted God to just smoke them right there. Thankfully, David might say, thankfully, the Lord is righteous, <laughs> right? Yeah, so he loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. But my brothers and sisters, what is the truth here? The truth is that God loves poets. And man, that can cultivate some anger among us if we're not, if we're not willing to do some work, right? God loves the person who wronged you as much as God loves you. You know what? That can really bug you. That can really annoy you. To have to then sit in the reality of your own humanity, your own capacity to hurt other people. Thankfully, God is righteous. Thankfully, God is a just judge. He's 
justice. It's amazing. Psalm 11 in Domino Confido. Arise, my God, and give the poor their day. For now I see the powers taking aim and targeting the weakest. See, they slay the true of heart, and still they falsely claim to be our shepherds. Where then can I fly? I envy birds their wings, but sorrows maim, and my complicities, my complicities constrain me. I desire with all my soul to seek the hill where God has set his citadel on high. Through all these sad constraints, I trust him still. I know that he can see the way things go. I know that these dark ways are not his will, for he loves justice. And the poor will know that he is their defender when he comes to topple tyrants and exalt the low. My sisters, if there is any word to leave with today, it is be angry. It's real. It's often a sign of an injustice that you are experiencing. Your anger is not bad. But in order for us to cultivate a life in which we don't sin in our anger, take it first to God. I say this to myself as much as I say it to you. Take it to God before you take it to your spouse. Take it to God before you take it to your coworker. Take it to God before you take it to your best friend. Because what I do know is that God can bring our anger back into our dance space. God can temper our anger so that it can motivate right response rather than reactive response. Be angry. There is plenty of reason for it. But put it in front of God first. Glennis. Said that and I was writing, I realized we should take it to God even before you take it to your best friend. Yes. Yeah, to talk about it. Yes. Yeah. Don't, right. it, don't talk about it to anybody. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, you and me both. You and my you and me both, sister. Let me close us in prayer. Gracious God, we do give you thanks and praise that you have given us dynamic emotion and you've also given us yourself thank you that you are indeed a refuge and we don't have to find you on a vista we don't have to find a hiding place we can be right where we are and be in you You are the God who is present in every breath. When we are angry in a volatile moment, would you be our breath, a deep and a cleansing breath, a breath that slows us down, a breath that equips us, a breath that allows us to ask for your help, to ask for your presence, to ask for your shelter, to ask for the power to trust in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, pay attention between now and January 12th, 13th, about what makes you angry, because there's more anger to talk about. And I think that it's really okay. It's really okay to come back to anger and, and tell some truths about it. Okay? Good to see you. Thanks for being with us. Lisa will create a breakout room if you guys would like to have conversation around today's uh, topic.